Our speaker tonight is Dr. Temple Grandin, Professor of Animal Science at Colorado State University. And she has done loads of hard things well. Age two to three, no speech, a lot of anxiety, diagnosis of autism. Dr. Grandin said at one point that she thinks in pictures and that English is really a second language for her. She has given so much hope to so many families and individuals. She is a best-selling author, a consultant to industry, and ladies and gentlemen, through her role modeling, her advocacy, her writing, her inventiveness of respectful care of animals, she has and will continue to make a real difference in our world. You know, some of you may know the Japanese have a concept of national treasures, human beings who really do extraordinary things. And she really is a national treasure. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Temple Grandin. Well, thank you so much for that really uh, lovely uh, introduction. Got lots of things to talk about tonight. I'm glad they turned these lights down because I like to be able to see the people that I'm talking to. I don't like looking out into a black void. Now, the thing about autism is it's a big spectrum. Little Albert right here had no language until age three. He would probably be labeled with autism. I worked with lots of people in the industry on skilled trades and uh, welding, metal fabrication, things like this. There are a bunch of people I worked with in the construction industry when we were building equipment at the meat plants that probably were on the spectrum. I've been out to Silicon Valley. They're everywhere. <laughs> they are everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And the problem that we got, oh, been to NASA too. Geek land, totally. There's this thing called NASA television. I watched a little engineer that looked like he was 12 years old. Uh, talk about his latest project. I'm pretty sure he was on the spectrum. <laughs> you see, the problem that we've got is at one end of the autism spectrum, it's sort of a personality variant. And then at the other end of it, you get much more severe, very severe. They're not going to be uh, uh, becoming a doctor or a scientist or any other kind of you know, field like that. See, I think there's a point where there's personality variation. A brain can be made more cognitive or thinking, or a brain can be made more social emotional. And there's fascinating research now on dogs and wolves that supports this, that I just found a few weeks ago online. And a wolf will watch another wolf open a puzzle box and get the box open. The dog's too busy socializing with the owner to watch the other, wolf, watch the other dog open the box. We see we've bred the dog to be totally social emotional. You know, so there's a lot of variation. When do geeks and nerds become mild autism? There's no black and white dividing line. I had delayed speech. I was the kind of kid in the 50s who used to just kind of throw away. But fortunately, my mother found a really good doctor who got me into a very good early intervention speech therapy program, very similar to the programs today. But I went to, kid, went to college with lots of uh, geeks and nerds that today would be labeled on the autism spectrum. But in the 50s, my generation, they pounded in the social skills. The th and it was pounded into all children. And so that helped the socially awkward kids you know, to get jobs, run businesses. You know, that, and now the things you have to be doing in social skills training is stuff that in the 50s it is pounded into every single kid. OK, it's a big spectrum. You know, don't get too hung up on the labels. I think that's extremely interesting about the, um, the depression genes. I've got to go look that up. I'm just wondering if it's serotonin transporter genes. Going to have to talk a little science afterwards. Uh-oh, now I just shut this off, okay. I can't emphasize enough the importance of early intervention. You got three-year-olds that are not talking, you have got to start doing something with them right now. And one of the things you need to do is teach these kids how to wait and take turns. That was taught to me with board games, really important. Now in the 50s, they used a method that I call teachable moment. 
And it was used with all children. Works really, really well with autistic kids. Okay, we're trying to teach table manners. So if I do something like uh, stir my drink with my finger, mother didn't scream no, she'd say use the spoon. Okay, mashed potatoes with the hands, she'd say use the fork. She gave the instruction rather than yelling no. That's how manners were taught. That was taught to all little kids. One time when I was really little, we had chocolate ice cream for dessert at school, and I went, and the teacher just picked it up and said quietly, you're not a dog. That was the last time that that happened. <laughs> now, mother had a really good sense how to stretch me just outside the comfort zone. There's a tendency lots of times to overprotect and coddle these kids. You gotta stretch them to get them to develop. Now, no sudden surprises. And, uh, you know, having a Broadway show where it isn't totally bright, things bang, bang, bang. That would have made it a lot more enjoyable for me. Fortunately, the shows in the 50s just weren't that loud compared to the things they have now. When I was 15, I had a chance to go to my aunt's ranch, and I was afraid to go. My mother said, you can go for a week, and if you hate it, come back. Or you go out there and you love it, you can stay. I got out there, and I loved it. And if I hadn't gone to my aunt's ranch when I was 15, I wouldn't have gotten involved in the cattle industry. That brings up another important thing. You've got to get kids out exposing them to interesting things. But I'm seeing way too much, too much coddling. And uh, one of the worst um, cases of coddling I saw just, within, just very recently was a 12-year-old when mom was still taking him in the ladies' room. And this kid was fully verbal. Well, I'll tell you how I dealt with that. We were at lunch at a restaurant, halfway through the meal, I told them what the rules were for guys. I've read the social book, so I told them what the rules were. <laughs> and then, at the end of the meal, I just casually said, it's now time for you to use the restroom. And he got up and he did it, all by himself. I've gotten kids that, you know, her mom was doing all the talking, talked to big theaters like this in front of, you know, 600 people or so. And they found out that they could do it. One of the things my mother had me do when I was seven, was be little party hostess. You know, learn how to greet the guests, serve them the snacks. That was a very, very good activity. And when I got older, that enabled me to do the scene in the movie where I went up and I got the business card from the editor of the Farmer Ranchman magazine. That was one of my first jobs. You gotta provide choices of stretching activities. You know, give some choices. You can do Boy Scouts, or you could do FFA, you could do a maker club, or you could do art, or you could do music. Give them some choices. But we've got to get them out doing things. The other thing, there were absolute rules about temper tantrums. And the rule is very simple. After I got all nice and calm, mother would just calmly say, there'll be no television tonight. No TV for one night. And we've got to limit the video game playing. I'm seeing very bad problems with video game addictions where they're not having good outcomes. I was allowed to have an hour of television weeknights and two hours a day on weekends. I think video game playing and you know, watching silly videos and things like that, yeah, we limit that. We've got to get them out doing other stuff. And when I was a little kid, I spent hours experimenting with my bird kite experiments. Lots and lots of outdoor play. I don't think kids are getting enough of that today. And I went to a maker fair that had all kinds of electronic activities for elementary school kids. But you know what the big hit was? Washing machine boxes that they could cut up and make forts out of. Now, sensory issues can be a big problem. And this is one area where they need to be doing research. Because sensory problems can range from nuisances to being absolutely, totally debilitating. Loud sounds hurt my ears. Now, sometimes loud sounds are better tolerated if the child can control it. In other words, you know, turn the sound off and it gets to be too much or leave the room where it is, where he's got control. And then sometimes they can learn to tolerate a bit more. Sensory issues are variable. One kid will have a hearing sensitivity, another kid will have visual sensitivity. And many of the individuals that remain nonverbal have probably jumbled up senses. When I was a little kid, they thought I was deaf. So they tested my hearing and they found out I wasn't deaf. But when the grown-ups yacked really fast, it went into gibberish. So my speech teacher would slow down when she talked to me. Slow down and enunciate the hard consonant sounds. Now I can remember this really well. She'd hold up a cup and she'd say, now say cup. And she sometimes would grab me a little bit. Say cup. And then she'd say cup. And she'd go back and forth between saying it fast and saying it slow. So then I'd learn the word. 
Some individuals have hearing that cuts in and out like a bad cell phone connection. And then there's other kids that are echolalic. like they yak out all this speech, but they don't know what it means. There's kind of three ways that language can be messed up. You can have auditory processing, where they're not hearing the auditory detail. I had problems with getting speech out. And then the echolalic kid, yep, yak out the whole movie script, but they don't know what it means. One of the big issues, brains that have problems, is attention shifting slowness, shifting back and forth between two different things. One of the things you gotta do with these kids when you encourage them to use their words is wait for them to respond. You got to give the child time to respond. They're like a slow computer. And this slide really illustrates really nicely attention shifting slowness. So if you put eye tracking software on somebody with autism, somebody that's normal, look at how many times the normal person's looking back and forth between the eyes. And the autistic person's trying to read the lips and they're not attention shifting. Now that's something that many of them have got. I can remember very one extremely frustrating experience when I was five. They were teaching us to mark down pictures that began with a B as in beautiful. And so I marked the suitcase down as a bag and they didn't give me to explain that in our house these were bags. It was so frustrating. The teacher just cut me off and said it's wrong. Well, no, I did understand the B concept. Now, some individuals who get visual breakup, similar to migraines, I don't have this problem, but I know people that do have it. And can you imagine if that's the way your vision was? You know, circuits here in the back of the brain are all not working to put the graphics file together right. And if you read some of the uh, descriptions that people have written that have visual problems, they'll describe this sort of stuff. Okay. Now, the thing is, the eye exam may be normal. These problems are in the back of the head. Suspect a visual processing problem if a child or adult is terrified of escalators. See, they can't see to get on and off. Often they're going to hate fluorescent lights because they can see them flicker. And the new LEDs, unfortunately, are not that much better. But, you know, how can you, you know, study your work if the whole room's flickering on and off like a strobe light? Okay, we got a kid that has trouble reading. Ask a child that has trouble reading if he ever sees the print jiggle on the paper. This does not explain all dyslexia. It explains a subtype. And there's a treatment for this that's so simple. It'd be silly not to do it. And I've seen it work on too many people. In fact, we just, I just tested it on a lady today. And uh, the simple thing we did with colored paper, and it worked for her. Light blue was her color. So if the print jiggles on the page, one of the things you might want to try is try printing the book on different colored papers, like tan, gray, light blue, light green, all the different pale colors. Lavender sometimes works, and the print will stop jiggling. Why does that work? Nobody knows. But you're talking about something so cheap and easy. It'd be stupid to flunk out of school because you didn't put lavender paper in the printer or change the colored background on the computer. Uh, kids that have this problem get their desk over by the... Um, you know, the window, get away from the fluorescent lights. See, the problem we've got with sensory issues is that to study these issues, we can't study them based on an autism diagnosis. We've got to study them based on what sensory problem the kid or adults got. Sound sensitivity, uh, visual uh, problems, auditory processing problems. That's what we've got to do. Now, people that have very severe sensory problems, they will describe extreme effort to block out background stimulus. They have to really work hard. They can't screen it out. And uh, sometimes they need breaks just to calm down because they get so sensory overloaded. Now, I found a paper online that actually won an award from the American Psychological Association that was called Environmental Enrichment is an Effective Treatment for Autism. Now, I want to make it very clear this is an adjunct. It doesn't replace speech therapy or ABA. It's an adjunct. But what they do in this paper as they stimulate two senses at the same time, always change the pair of senses that they stimulate. Just remember three key words, autism, environmental, enrichment. And you can get this paper. Now use simple household things. They used eight different aromatherapies, so you might smell cinnamon and touch some smooth wood. And or you might do, um, uh, be a, touch something rough and listen to some classical music. 
So you always were changing the pair of senses stimulated. Always two things at the same time and always changing them. And psychologists evaluated the children before treatment and after treatment, blind evaluations, and there were improvements. Now this is something that's um, very simple to do. And so, uh, and it's all, this is also an evidence-based method. And you can get the paper online. There's a free version. If you can't find it, you might hit the $30 paywall, but that, then buy the paper and then use the photocopier big time. <laughs> because maybe this could help desensitize some of the sensory issues. And it used very simple household things, like warm and cold spoons is one of the things they used. OK, if you're working with an older child or adult that remains nonverbal, these are some great books to read. They are written by people that are nonverbal, that look very low functioning, and they type completely independently. Nobody's holding a wrist or anything. It's completely independent typing. I had a chance to meet Tito. He came into a medical library. He looked super low functioning, flapping and shaking. And I wanted to find a picture where there was no way it could be rehearsed. So I found a picture of an astronaut riding a horse out in the desert in a spacesuit. It was for a tech company. And I said, Tito, tell me about this picture. And he types really fast, Apollo 11 on a horse, and then gets up and jumps around. You know, there was no way that was cued. And he describes a sensory jumbled world. And these books are for sale out on the book stand. Um, but there's the problem with extreme effort, problems with knowing where body boundary is. You read their descriptions. Uh, seeing and hearing, is, especially seeing, is just completely jumbled up. Touch and smell still work. That's why they're using so much touch and smell. Scientists have learned a lot of things about the brain. And one of the big places where there's abnormalities <coughs> is in the inter-office communications between different parts of the brain. That's where a lot of the abnormalities are. I think we need to be looking at a lot of these personality traits, like a music mixing board. When does being socially awkward uh, become autism? No black and white dividing line. Maybe more anxious or less anxious. Now a lot of the, okay, I understand they've just found this genetics thing with depression, but what's been found with a lot of things, and looking at the autism genetics, it's a complicated genetics. It's not simple where there's a single gene that makes autism. It's sort of like a little bit of the trait, you get a good you get a scientist who will help put us on the moon, put us on the moon. You get too much of the trait, and you get severe nonverbal autism. Because you get out in the tech parts of the world, you get an awful lot of um, autistic kids when two programmers get together. <laughs> see, when you hear a word, you see a word, you speak a word, or you think about a word, different parts of the brain turn on. And then you've got to have inter-office communications between the different parts of the brain. This is where the abnormalities are. Now, that's my head. And that is the connectome. This was done by Walter Snyder at the University of Pittsburgh. You say, what are the circuits between different parts of the brain? Well, you all know in biology, you've got the axon, you've got the, you know, the nerve center, and then you've got the long tail, the long nerve tail. There's nerve tails that are this long that make fiber bundles going all the way across the brain. And with this new high-definition imaging, those fiber bundles can actually be dissected out. This is a technology that our Defense Department paid for, for head injuries in veterans. Now, I think you could use uh, some of this technology to diagnose things like speech issues. So a lot of things it could be used for. Well, the connectome's really pretty without my skull. And you can see the little tiny threads there. OK, now that's a cable bundle where speak what you see. Goes from visual cortex up to the language part of the brain. That's a normal one, and that's mine. Lots of extra bushes. Now, at what point do extra bushes become an abnormality? There's going to be no black and white dividing line. If you went out and you scanned piles of people, you're going to find a big range. But there's trade-offs and things. This is probably what gives me visual thinking, where you put a key word in, and I start to see pictures, just like Google for Images. Now, the price I paid for that is if you count the number of fibers for speak what you see, I have fewer of them, less bandwidth. But there's enough fibers there that with working on them, you could probably increase the transmission on the fibers that were left. And I finally did learn to speak. 
And I can remember having trouble just getting the words out. It was really hard for me. And that's my auditory circuit. Speak what you hear. Got a little teeny weeny weeny little auditory circuit. Ooh, now I pressed the wrong thing again. I can't emphasize enough. Build on the kid's strengths. This is a picture a nine-year-old gave to me in perspective. When I was in third grade, my ability in art really started to show up. And my mother always encouraged my ability in art. And I would have drawn the same horse heads over and over again. But mother always encouraged me to draw lots of other things. If the kid likes trains, let's read about trains. Let's do math with trains. Tap into the motivation of that fixation. You know, you want to build up on things that they could turn into a career. Things like music. And when I was bad, they never took art away. It's TV you take away. You never take away art or computer programming or a musical instrument or something that could become a job. Okay, a young man sent me this to show how he has movies in his head. That's the way I think. Now, we've got to be very careful not to confuse this with hallucinations. These are not hallucinations. <laughs> This is how I think. No picture, no thinking. And as an equipment designer, I found I could test run equipment in my mind. I didn't know this was a special skill. I thought everybody could test run equipment in their mind. And it's been an interesting journey for me learning how other people think differently. And half the cattle in this country are handled in systems I've designed. And if you want to see those systems, you can go on Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Grandin. You can look that up online. <laughs> then you might wonder why curved, because as the cattle come around the bend, they think they're going back to where they, went, where they came from. It's using their natural behavior. And there's an aerial view of one of my systems they duplicated for the movie. And here is the beginning of some of my systems being built. The Swift Plant in 1974, the McElhaney Cattle Company, that was the first dip vat. That was the one that got the metal plate put in it, uh, which get, did get taken out. And there were some good people that helped me out, too. And now let's talk about how do we teach social skills. On that very first job in Swift in 1974, I criticized some welding. And I said it looked like a pigeon doo-dooed on it. <laughs> and... Uh, Harley, the plant engineer, pulled me down to his office and he said, you know, we got to take care of these little cancers before they metastasize. <laughs> and you're going to apologize to Whitey the welder for this. And then he explained to me that even though Whitey's welds weren't very pretty, he was a maintenance welder rather than a you know, construction welder. And I apologized. And then Harley also told me that if I didn't like Whitey's welding, I should come and see him because he's Whitey's boss. But he didn't scream and yell at me. He just explained what I should do. You just got to be direct and really, really simple. Now, in all the years I've worked in construction, I find it affects how I approach things. We have to get the job done. And so we're all about outcomes. You got to get a job done, and you got to make it work. You know, when we get a kid out there launched into a good job, then we've gotten the job done. Has a good life, stays out of trouble with the law, all kinds of things like that. Then you've done the job. And we got to be thinking a lot more about getting them into the job market. OK, this is uh, one of my dip vat drawings. And one of the things that really motivated me in, when I was in my 20s is I wanted to prove to people I wasn't stupid. And when I got these drawings done, I looked at it and I go, well, I guess I'm not stupid You know, if I could create something like this. But the thing I learned is I sold my work by showing off my portfolio. You know, and there are some people on the spectrum extremely good at art. They could be selling it on Etsy. They could be selling it on all kinds of internet platforms. But they got to learn how to do art other people want. And I can remember when I was in high school, I painted some signs. And my first sign painting job where I sold a sign was to a beauty shop. Well, that's not exactly one of my big interests. <laughs> but I had to make a sign that the lady would want. Really important thing that you've got to learn. You know, how do you do jobs for other people? So let's go through my work history. Little kids, party hostess, chores, age 13, mother set up a sewing job in the neighborhood with a seamstress. And I took apart dresses and I hemmed them. 15, I was cleaning eight horse stalls, basically running a horse barn. I didn't do the financial part, but everything except that. I was um, doing carpentry work. 
painting signs and selling them. When I was in college, I did career-relevant internships. We've got to get people into doing a lot more job sort of things. There's another, the other drawing for the dip vat. Now, I realized my thinking was different when I asked people about something like a church steeple. And I was shocked to find out that some people get this vague, generalized thing. I don't get any vague, generalized thing. I just see specific ones, you know, like childhood ones, ones in Fort Collins, uh, famous ones. Now, the more different steeples that I see, then I can start to put them into categories. There's subcategories of steeples, cathedrals, New England type, chapel type. Then there's some churches that don't have them that look like warehouses. Maybe that's another type. <laughs> you see, concepts are learned with specific examples. Now, I used to joke around that I had a big visual, circuit, visual thinking circuit in my head. Turns out that I do. And there's another view of it right there. Uh, and there is an art professor that has a bigger one than mine. But I'm probably in the top 25%. OK, some other brain scans show that my left parietal area is pretty well trashed out with cerebral spinal fluid. And one issue that you often will get into <coughs> is problems with working memory. I cannot remember long sequences of verbal information. If I have to do a task that is a series of steps, I've got to write them down like a pilot's checklist. And then if they're written down like a pilot's checklist, then I'm going to be absolutely fine. I had horrible times with algebra. I think in a lot of cases, we need to let these kids jump to uh, geometry. So how did they get through college? Because thank goodness, the educational fad of 1967 was finite math which was probability, matrices, and statistics. That saved me. Also, I wasn't shy about asking for tutoring. That all gets back to my party host days. <laughs> I wasn't shy. I failed the first quiz. I, found the, I got the math teacher to tutor me. And then when I was in graduate school, I got another graduate student to tutor me. I did something about it before I totally failed. Now, this is one of my really important slides, the different kinds of minds. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. Memories are stored as pictures, have trouble with algebra. And then there's the pattern thinker, the music and math. They think in patterns. Now, you might think I just made all this stuff up. Well, I kind of independently figured this out. But then, when I was working on my book, The Autistic Brain with Richard Panic, I found journal articles to back this up. I have evidence-based, and they are all in the reference list of the autistic brain. And then I found a good paper just two days ago about visual thinkers remembering childhood events. And they remember them in more detail. Then you got the verbal facts guy. This is the guy that knows all the uh, like history and movie actors or baseball players, you know, whatever his interest is. Then some people are auditory thinkers. Now, most so-called normal people are mixtures of the different types of thinkers. But we've got to you know, work on what the kid is good at. And the ones that are the pattern thinkers, they're going to be your computer programmers, engineers. There's two ways to do the math, more verbally or more visual spatially. A lot of educators get too hung up on one method or another. It doesn't matter. It's the outcome that matters. Yeah, when you're in construction, you know, we use um, you know, some different kinds of materials. Like, for example, you could build a plane out of metal or build a plane out of composites. It kind of achieves sort of the same thing. You've got to start looking at outcomes. Now I just want to give you an idea of how the pattern thinker thinks. This praying mantis is made out of a single sheet of folded paper. And what's in the background is the folding pattern. Boy, that's not my mind. <laughs> that's not my mind at all. And there are some great little stars that some kids gave me. You see, the thing that really bothers me is a visual thinker. I'll go to a gifted meeting, I'll go visit NASA, I'll go visit Fermi Lab, Silicon Valley, go visit construction stuff and business stuff. And one geeky kid's over in the gifted class. There's another little geeky kid in autism, and there's another one that's 10 years older who's working for Google. And they're all the same type of kid. <laughs> but they're going down different paths. You see, I've made it a point to make sure I'm still doing you know, things with livestock. I like, I like going from the, between the different silos. 
And I make a point of doing some gifted conferences. And I see the same kits. And then I go to a seminar at a gifted conference on social skills. And I'm going, looks like an autism conference. <laughs> and then in Silicon Valley, they avoid the labels, put them in Montessori classes, and, uh, and then they apprentice them into the field. That's what they do with them. Oh, and in oh, Silicon Valley, parents really limit the video games. That's something they're really big on. OK, some of the stuff that really helped me was a lot of hands-on activities. You know, where I had friends in high school where I was not teased, was horseback riding, electronics, and model rockets. We've got to get them into these shared interests. The other thing about hands-on activities is they teach practical problem-solving skills. You know, the thing is, you've got to, sometimes you do a project wrong. Then you've got to figure out how to make your project work. You know, I'm seeing today kind of a lack of resourcefulness. You know, a lot of the things that mother did, she just did in the neighborhood, like getting the sewing job. One time I suggested to one mom that her son needed to walk dogs, you know, get a job outside the home. And she said, we don't have a program for that. I'm going, a program? You just set it up in the neighborhood. <laughs> now, when you think in pictures, I, how do you understand abstract stuff? Like I learned the Lord's Prayer. Well, the power and the glory is a rainbow with an electric tower at the base of the rainbow. That's the power and the glory. All right, here's another super important slide. They give you insight on how people on the spectrum think. It's bottom up, not top down. Word thinking, you tend to overgeneralize and be a top down thinker. I have found that people that are very abstract in their thinking don't ask enough questions for troubleshooting. And I have this happen on factory problems, dog problems, horse problems, and the autistic kid behavior problems. They'll say, well, what do I do about autistic behavior problems in the classroom? Well, I don't know, because I don't have enough information. Or someone will expect me to answer what to do about the crazy dog. Well, I don't know. Is the dog crazy happy, or did he rip your leg off? <laughs> um, that might both be a crazy dog. See, I've got to have a lot more information. Specific examples create concepts. And to learn a concept, I take a whole lot of specific examples and kind of put them into different categories. Putting specific exa examples into categories is the beginning of concept formation. It's a very important concept. That's why we've got to get them out doing things to fill up the database with lots of information. And here's a picture that a young man gave to me. He's sorting cats and dogs in the different boxes in his head. OK, now as I go out and I experience more and more canids, OK, that includes wolves and hyenas, or felids, the lions and tigers. See, there's other cat animals. So I can have this big category of felids, and then I'm going to have you know, big cats, and I got the wild cats, and then I got the domestic cats, and then I got the weird domestic cats. Uh, you know, you can make subcategories of the cat category. So when I was a little kid, when a dachshund came into the neighborhood, how did I know it was a dog? See, previously, I could separate cats from dogs by size. But when the dachshund came in, I had to find a feature, a sensory-based feature that she shared with dogs. And that'd be the same smell and barking. Also, the nose shape was the same. Play games with categories. You can have an object that's rectangular and red. OK, if I'm wearing the hat for work, uh, you know, it depends upon who's wearing it, where they're wearing it. But play games with categories so they can learn that you can have things in more than one category. The autistic brain is into finding the details. This helped me in my work with cattle because some of the first work I did, I went out in the chutes and, I, and the cattle would stop at a reflection. In fact, today I was on the phone with the quality assurance people at one of the big packing plants and they had just put up some gates that were made out of stainless steel, and the pigs wouldn't walk by them. And I said, we've got to make a dull finish. So I said, go get a big brown piece of cardboard, tape it on that gate. I know it's not going to last very long, but I just want to do proof of concept. If I get rid of the reflection, do the pigs go better? Then you can just do that with a piece of cardboard, and then if that works, then we're going to have to do something else to get rid of the shiny gate. But when I was one of the first people to think about what those cattle were seeing when they were walking through the chute. And when I first started doing that, people thought that was really crazy. You would look at what cattle were seeing. 
And when I was in high school, I used to be teased and called tape recorder. And I couldn't figure out why they were calling me that. And it's because I always use the same phrases. But as I get out and I do more and more stuff and fill up the internet in my head with more and more information, then it gets less and less like a tape recorder. That's why we got to get them out doing things. Teaching numbers. You can have two bottles, two people, two uh, thumbtacks, two paper clips. You know, there's a lot of different things you can count. They've got to learn that numbers apply to a variety of things. Teach subtraction or part of something. Cooking is a great way to teach proportionality. Teach fractions. So you cut the pizza in half. It's part of something. And then I have some math people go, well, that's wrong. You need to use the number line. Well, you know what? You can do both. We start out with the half a pizza, and then you have the number line, and you cut it in half. But let's maybe start with the pizza first. Might be easier. OK, position words. You've got to use several different examples to teach a concept of something like up or down. Because if you just do it with the stairs, they're going to think it only applies to the stairs. You're going to need five or six different examples for each position word. So they learn the concept of up, down, over, on, beside, between, all what I'm going to call those the position words. You know, so to teach meaning, let's start off with nouns first, starting off with food, clothing, things like that, toys, and then position words. Now, another brain scan that was done showed that I was more interested in looking at pictures of things rather than pictures of people. But we need to have some people interested in things. I mean, after all, Tesla, who invented the power plant, will be labeled autistic today. I think we all like electricity. <laughs> OK, shared interests, social interaction through shared interests. 4-H, FFA, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, maker community groups, art, theater. Theater is another great thing to get kids involved in, being in plays, music. But how is a kid going to find out he likes theater if he doesn't try it? You see, and what I'm learning about careers, and that, and that doesn't matter whether it's somebody on the spectrum, diagnosed or undiagnosed, or just the so-called normal person, lots of career interests start in high school. And how do we get kids interested in stuff? Let's get some interesting magazines in the school library. Science, nature. How about some Business Week? Fortune, Wired. Oh, there's all kinds of cool things out there, like the PayPal guy right now is working on fusion power. You ought to see the latest Time magazine. It is science fiction. Goldman Sachs, Amazon, and PayPal are paying for that. Boy, that would solve a lot of energy problems. But we're going to need us visual thinkers to prevent, to prevent accidents like Fukushima. The Fukushima nuclear power plant meltdown was a visual thinking mistake. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but if I'd been the person drawing up the concrete for that job, I'm going, wait a minute, we've got a serious problem here. All I know is if the emergency cooling pump fails to work, that's like beyond horrible, and you've now put it in a basement that's not waterproof, and there were no watertight doors, and the emergency pump and the generators drowned, and it burned up. And then the next mistake was social. They never asked for help. They sat there and watched it burn up. It could have been stopped. I know people in heavy construction that build big meatpacking plants. They could have gone over there with GE engineers and stopped that. You know, pump seawater in there, big pumps. Any piece of equipment you need, you, all they had to do was pick the horn up. We used to call it the phone the horn. All they had to do was pick it up. They didn't do it. You need a giant helicopter? Go look up online what the biggest helicopter is. Can it pick up a truck size generator? I don't know. I want to find that out because I'm going to need that. OK, <laughs> let's get back to, um, to um, troubleshooting. When you're trying to troubleshoot a problem, well, I don't care if it's an autistic kid's problem or it's a dog problem or something wrong with a piece of equipment, people don't ask for enough detail. OK, the first thing we got to do uh, somebody said that just told me they had a, they had a nonverbal person with autism that was screaming all the time. That was another phone call I had this afternoon. And I said, the first thing we've got to do is rule out a hidden painful medical problem, a yeast infection, a urinary tract infection, an earache, a toothache. You've got to rule that out. 
or maybe they're reacting to oh, sound sensitivity. Or maybe they were frustrated because they can't communicate. I mean, there's a lot of things. You've got to figure out, is it biology or you've got a behavioral problem? Can't communicate? Oh, sometimes I blow a big hissy just to get attention. Sometimes I blow a big hissy to get out of doing something I didn't want to do. <laughs> you've got to ask a lot of questions. OK, here are some accommodations we might need. Um, well, like putting on a theater show that doesn't have guns blasting off in it. Some kids may not be able to tolerate the supermarket. But maybe they can learn to tolerate it if they feel they have control. So we go into Walmart when they're not tired, because this gets worse when they get tired. And if it gives me a signal like this, I'll take them out of the Walmart. Um, Multitasking is a problem. And long strings of verbal instruction, that just does not work for most of them. And multitasking can be really, really hard. And then I get asked about driving. And the way I learned how to drive was I did 200 miles going back and forth to the mailbox at my aunt's ranch. And it added up to 200 miles by the end of the summer. And that was burning up, you know, over a, a, burned up about a tank of gas before we did any traffic. I'd recommend that. An entire tank of gas burned up in some totally safe place before you do driver's ed. Driver's ed throws them into it way too quickly. They're putting you in traffic before you've even learned how to drive the car. OK, now here are some bad accommodations, because I'm seeing too many kids kind of getting a handicap mentality. So you got a shy kid that does his public speaking on Skype, no way. When I was in graduate school, I panicked and walked out of my very first class. Yep, but you got to get back on the horse and do it. And the other thing we got to fight are these recluses in the room. Kids just staying in the room, becoming recluses. That is something. My mother wouldn't allow that, and my boarding school did not allow that. We've got to get them out doing stuff. Um, I found an 18-year-old honor student that, that did not know how to grocery shop. And then you've got the parent that always speaks for the child. We've got to give that kid opportunities all the time. Use their language. 50s upbringing, turn-taking. We had formal sit-down meals. Being on time, that was pounded into me. Very young age. Yes, I had to sit through church. Maybe I thought it was a bore, but I had to sit through it. Sometimes you got to do something you don't want to do because other people want to do it. Saying please and thank you. And when I forgot to say please, mother would cue me and she'd go, you forgot to say, you know, or if I forgot to say thank you, you forgot to say, and she'd cue me. And I already talked about the um, teachable moments. I already talked about that. The other thing is the rules were the same at home and school. Mother and the teacher worked together. The rules were the same. They were the same at the Culver's house. They were the same at the Woods house. And there was one house where we could be bad. How about a wet toilet paper fight in the living room? How about a mud fight in the garage? <laughs> well, how about gluing his mother's bedroom door shut? <laughs> Wouldn't have dared do that at home. That's for sure. And the other thing, mother made it very clear Comments about other people were not acceptable. I can remember my sister and I were giggling about how Aunt Bella's bosoms bounced up and down like horse feed bags. <laughs> <laughs> and Mother made it really clear that if Bella heard that, we'd be grounded. We'd be in a pile of trouble for that. Shaking hands, we need to be doing as elementary school kids, ordering food in restaurants. That's something I could do very young. Shopping, I go shopping at Woolworths, buy my little toy airplanes, and I got 50 cents a week, and I knew exactly what I could buy with 50 cents a week when I was seven and eight years old. I could get 10 candy bars, five comics, but if I wanted that 69 cent plane, I had to have two weeks of allowance. That started teaching the meaning of money. <coughs> and doing chores, that's another thing really young kids should be doing. Need to be doing a lot more free play stuff. I was so happy to see all these elementary school kids from Boulder, Colorado, not a single phone out because the boxes were so much fun. Oh, that was just wonderful. I stayed down at that Maker Fair all day. It was, it was fabulous. Okay, here are the guys at Jet Propulsion Lab. They put the Mars rover on Mars. And you know that book, The Martian? That started as a blog. Then it was a 99-cent Kindle, and it went viral. 
So you've got free platforms. If someone's a writer, you can put these 99 cent Kindle books up. But don't put rubbish up on that. Let's test drive it, uh, edit it, and things like that. Only put good stuff up. You know, who knows? You might have the next Martian. And the guy had a really funny interview, and he was talking about it started like going to getting all these checks and stuff. He just couldn't believe it. You know, but it was real. And there were lots of Asperger types at JPL. But I can tell you, NASA doesn't tolerate throwing briefcases. Absolutely does not tolerate that. And one of the things I had to do, because I got kicked out of ninth grade for fighting, is I had to switch from anger to crying. That's OK for guys to cry. Because when they shut down the space shuttle, they cried. Go look it up on 60 Minutes. It's the saddest thing you ever saw. And I went to a very sad high school uh, career fair where a NASA scientist was showing space shuttle stuff just before they shut down the shuttle. And he was crying. And I was crying, too. It was awful. But crybabies get to have these cool jobs. <laughs> the guy who threw the briefcase, and this is a real case, lost his really cool job, even though the briefcase didn't hit anybody. That's just not tolerated. OK, this is a rule system I still live with. If you want to have a civilized society, you can't be burning down this theater, killing people, robbing banks, and stuff like that. You just don't do that stuff. Then you have your courtesy rules. But then you got illegal, but not bad. OK, we live in a state where you have to be 16 to work in retail. I'm going to put that kid 12 years old in the cash economy. I was just down in Texas, two miles off the Mexican border, and I go, yep, corner bodega. That 12-year-old's going to be working it. I say, like, got to learn work skills. That's an illegal but not bad cash economy. Do it. <laughs> I, I was in the cash economy when I was 13 with my little sewing job. You know, you just sometimes do stuff like that. Get out of algebra somehow. You got to just do it. That's an illegal but not bad. <laughs> then you have the sins of the system, and don't touch these puppies. And they're different in different countries. In the US, we can criticize the government. In another country, they'll throw you in jail if you criticize the government, especially if you do it online. You know, there are certain things um, you better learn the rules about sex. I just read a case where an 18-year-old played around with a girl in an equipment closet on the roof of a building, and he's on the sex offender list. If he'd been 17, it would be kids doing something stupid. You better find out what the statutes are. Uh, as long as you know the rules, then everything's fine. Maybe you better card her. I know that's really dorky. You better look up your state statutes because they're draconian. Kids being stupid doesn't get differentiated from a serial rapist. Um, I've heard really crazy things like an eight-year-old, they want to put an eight-year-old on the sex offender list because he kissed another kid in class. I don't know. But you better not mess with that stuff because it gets you in trouble. You know, you've got to know what the rules are, and uh, you don't mess with those rules. It's a sin of the system. OK, we've got a nonverbal person with a lot of behavior issues. We've got to rule out all of these bad things that can make you really feel a lot of pain. Acid reflux, big number one, constipation, urinary tract infections, yeast infections, toothaches. You've got to rule that stuff out. And there's my squeezing machine. When I got into puberty, I had horrible anxiety. It was like being in a constant state that there's danger. Imagine if we lock the doors of this theater and we throw about 25 super deadly snakes in here. You're going to be just so in the kind where there's, you're going to die if you get bitten by these snakes. You're going to just be in a state of fear all the time. That's the way I was. I found exercise helped calm me down. The other thing that helped calm me down was pressure. And I also found out in brain scans that my fear center was three times larger than normal. And how did I uh, control that? I know I've been on antidepressants since 1980. Little dose of disipramine. It worked like magic. I know a lot of visual thinkers, a lot of designers. Uh, Prozac's keeping them off the drugs and alky. <coughs> Little bit of antidepressant to stop that horrible, horrible panic attacks. This is where a little bit of the right medicine can really, really make a big difference. But I want to emphasize a little bit of the right medicine. You want to try a medication, try one thing at a time, try to figure out what works. 
Don't start a new school at the same time. But the thing I have found is that if the dose gets too high, then they get agitation and insomnia when they're using these drugs for, uh, for anxiety. In my book, Thinking in Pictures, I describe my experiences, my own personal experiences with um, anxiety. Now, the drugs saved me. There's a rear view of me in the squeezing machine. And there's a therapist working with some pressure. See, some kids really respond well to deep pressure, and others don't. You see, these sensory problems are so variable. We need to figure out who this is really helpful with. And there's a kid in a, in a swing. And some kids really respond to rhythm and balancing, things like riding horses. And some kids, you can teach them to sing. They can sing the words before they can say it. And then you get into things like wait at vests, work on some, don't work on others. Now the problem is if I go on the PubMed database and I type in autism weighted vest, the paper flies right up in your face and says they don't work. Well, the problem is they work on a subtype. But if you go across all of the kids with autism, you see the ones where it doesn't work block out the ones where it does work. Now if you've got a kid that seeks pressure, then it's probably going to work. Now you're talking about a really cheap thing here. You got to remember, I come out of construction. And something simple, like the colored paper, just try it. I just found somebody today, light blue is her color. And uh, she's going to try to look into it more, had problems with reading all her life. You know, it's something simple. OK, I like to be really practical. If something's cheap, it's not dangerous, and it takes me like 15 minutes to try it out, I'm gonna, I don't have to have a very high evidence base. Just go ahead and do it. But there's other things. If it's going to be extremely time consuming, yeah, I have to have a lot more evidence base. Somebody asked me today about brain yoga. Well, that costs money and it's time consuming. Now, we know that mindfulness training and yoga is sometimes helpful. Now, is brain yoga more helpful than regular yoga? Uh, you're going to have to get me a good scientific paper on that one because that gets time consuming and it gets expensive. And regular yoga, I can get videos online for free or do it down at the local health club, you know, really cheaply. Okay, I think it's really important to get these little kids so they're gonna like being held because it helps them to feel feelings of kindness. Just remember, deep pressure desensitizes, tickle touches, alert. Jobs, we already talked a lot about that. Another really important thing is mentors. I had a fabulous science teacher. You know, there's a lot of boys that are just getting into piles of trouble. One of the things they'd be really good at is auto mechanics. You know, a lot of schools in a lot of places have taken out the auto shop, welding, woodworking. And how's a kid going to get interested in those things if they don't get exposed to it? And there's a huge shortage right now in this country of welders, diesel mechanics, and auto mechanics. Huge shortage and a ton of good jobs. Get, you know, bring in trade journals. You know, and then these other magazines I, I talked about. And then making a portfolio. But we've got to get kids exposed to stuff. OK, what do we do with the video game players as we wean them off? Let's see if he's going to like uh, auto shop. Or maybe learn how to write some JavaScript, learn how to make video games. Now, there are a few kids that get addicted to video games that learn how to make them. Well, back in the old days, in the DOS days, where you could see the computer guts all the time, yeah, then they learn how to make them. Today, they've got to be formally introduced to programming, you know, to learn how to make them. Well, when I was in high school, I wasn't doing very much studying, but boy, I did a lot of carpentry work, work skills. And then when I was getting my master's degree, I painted signs for the Arizona State Fair's stupid carnival shows. <laughs> and that's me up there on the top of the Himalayan monster. Stupid exhibit. It was a wax dummy in a freezer chest full of ice. Just totally stupid. <laughs> so how did I get that job? I walked up to an old sign painter and I showed him my portfolio. And then that morphed into doing freelance work on, uh, on corral systems. But now you've got so many platforms online to sell stuff. Like LinkedIn, there's another magic word. Write this word down. It's a magic word. It's forum. It's a magical word when you use it in Google, forum. And then you combine it with programming forum, sewing forum, theater forum, art forum, anything that you're interested in. And all these great discussion groups come up, places where you can show your work off. It's a fabulous word. I couldn't believe it. 
Okay, jobs for middle school kids. How about walking other people's dogs? I want to get them outside the home. Church jobs. Those need to start around 10. Ushers, you know, passing the plate around. They get a little bit older, um, setting up chairs for the social, edit video, all kinds of different things. But I'm seeing a lot of parents have trouble letting go. I talked to one mom of a 15-year-old, really good animator, and his church needed some video to edit it. And I said, well, why don't you have your kid do it? And then I said, let's have him do it in the church office. We've got to get out of the bedroom. And mom started to get really upset, and she said she couldn't let go. I said, I'm talking about a church office one mile down the road. <laughs> when I was 15, I was on a jet airplane flying from New York to Arizona. A little bit of a difference there. How about working in a farmer's market, working in a greenhouse? I mean, just find, just look at things in the neighborhood. You know, Lego mindstorms, robotics clubs. You know, some of these boys that are headed in piles of trouble, get them interested in robotics. I was reading a magazine one time about some juvenile delinquents, and they brought them over to school for some other function, and they stumbled into a robotics class. That saved a couple of these kids. And there's another one of my drawings. I like to show drawings on. <laughs> Okay, this is one of my designs in SketchUp. SketchUp is free three-dimensional software. It's got the right price, it's free. Type that word SketchUp into, into Google. Community colleges have all kinds of career-related classes. You know, look it up, get on the websites, look. All right, free stuff online. Khan Academy. Khan Academy has free programming classes. Okay, let me tell you what's hot. JavaScript, think coffee. That's, um, that's the program for Minecraft. C++, Charlie++, Ruby, and Python. Well, just last week, I got the websites up. I got into the beginnings of the lessons. Well, I don't understand it. But I do know the website works because I was just on it last week. Code Academy, Udacity's charging now. Uh, Coursera's got free college courses. There's all kinds of stuff online. Use that magic forum word and combine it with other key words. I was just amazed when I used that magic word, the stuff that, um, that got pulled up. The internet is like a big lawn, with, but there's dog doo-doos out there you don't want to step in. <laughs> but you avoid that. There's all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things. I got fascinated by optical illusion rooms because my science teacher showed it to me in a movie. And then he challenged me to figure out how to make it, to figure out how to do it. You gotta show kids stuff to get them interested in interesting things. And there's the movie crew. Lots of people on the spectrum there. And how did they get those jobs? They had a friend that knew somebody that needed some scenery painted. Find those back doors. Get your portfolio on your phone. You just never know what you could get into. I went over to the Arizona State Fair and I was painting signs at the Arizona State Fair. <laughs> well, now all the banners are these plastic computerized ones and nobody has hand-painted signs anymore. And there's a plant where I started. And you know, guess what I was talking about today on the phone? We were talking about the, um, we talked to one plant today about reflection on a piece of stainless steel and I talked to another plant uh, whether they were asking me whether they should put music in their cattle yards and what kind of music to have. This plant right here, back in the early 70s, had, had country western music playing throughout the whole entire yard, and they felt that it made their cattle calmer. So I was telling them about that. I mean, don't use hard rock, pounding kind of stuff. Now, when I first tried to get in there, yep, front door didn't work. But then, I was wearing this shirt that's now in the Cowgirl Hall of Fame, which I hand embroidered this, a computer in China embroidered this. <laughs> uh, but I was wearing this shirt that I hand embroidered and I met the wife of their insurance agent. It was a chance meeting. You never know where you, and I was wearing the portfolio. And then there's a scene in the movie where I get the, the business card off the editor of the Farm Arrangement. I actually did that. And then when I got that press pass, I could get into things like the National Cattlemen's Meeting. I could get out of a $500 registration fee. I realized how precious that press pass was. Okay, jobs for visual thinkers like me. What I do is industrial design. Steve Jobs was not a programmer. He was an artist, fascinated by calligraphy. That's why computers have pretty fonts. Yes, he sat in on the course and he didn't pay for it. <laughs> 
And he was a filthy, dirty hippie when he did that. <laughs> but he, he made up the idea of things like pinch the picture like this. He made up that idea. Then the engineer had to make it work. You see, that's the different kinds of minds working together. All kinds of graphic art stuff, drafting. Man, I had a guy show me a most amazing thing he did with Photoshop. He went out in the junkyard and he took a picture of a rusted old car sitting in the grass. And then he manipulated it with Photoshop until it looked like this Art Deco kind of car. It was the coolest thing. And he had it on his phone and I said, boy, this stuff's professional grade. You need to get a website, put it up. You need to be putting this stuff up on LinkedIn. But don't put rubbish up on those things. And the other thing I learned I didn't put squeeze machine stuff up on my cattle things. You know, I kept those things separate. <laughs> Photographers, uh, animal trainers. Um, I know a guy who's um, in a wheelchair, and he showed me some of his flower photography. It was excellent. I said, you need to go pro. You can go pro. Your stuff's really good. Film flower shows. It's wheelchair accessible convention centers. You know, go do it. Obviously, a wheelchair's not going to skydive. But let the photo photography of flowers, that's something he can do. OK, these are your mathematicians, computer programmers, engineers, physicists, math teachers, statistics. And then there's data analytics. You know how those websites know what you want to purchase on all the shopping centers, all the shopping sites? That's called data analytics. It's really creepy. I bought a new car. And then I looked at beef plant video. Guess what? A week later, I had car ads all over it for the same car that I'd bought. I don't know how it found out that, but it did. <laughs> Verbal thinkers. These are the guys that love history, things like that. Some of these guys would be very good at specialized retail because they know every special product. It could be jewelry, it could be shoes, it could be produce, it could be a lot of different things. Um, copy editing, writers. Some of them like science fiction. Well, let's take a writing class. Let's learn how to structure a story correctly. Don't put rubbish up on that 99 cent Kindle. You want to put good stuff up on that. So you may take some classes so you develop your skills. It's amazing now the platforms you've got that are free that you can use to show your work off out in the marketplace. But pull only good things on the portfolio because what you want is somebody looks at that and goes 30 second, wow. Look at a piece of code, maybe it's this long on a page, even on a phone. They go, oh man, it's pretty great JavaScript. I mean, I wouldn't have pretty JavaScript from bad JavaScript. But somebody that would look at that and go, oh wow, then I want to see a whole bunch more of it. But there's all kinds of things. OK, how about people that are um, nonverbal or poorly verbal? Let's look at what they can do. Some like garden work. You know, there's a lot of different jobs. And the thing is, they know fake work from real work. I remember um, I went to, to talk one time a behavior analyst to get a really great behavior analyst. And she was, um, came in as a consultant because this teenager that was nonverbal was throwing things. And she looked at what they were making him do. And what they were making him do was set the table, set the table, take it down, set the table, take it down, set the table, take it down. That's not what you do in real life. You set the table, eat, then you clean it up. But it was stupid making him set it and reset it. He knew that wasn't what was done in real life. And so he, re he ended up throwing the silverware. It takes a village to raise a child. I mean, mother did so many things in the neighborhood. We just got to figure out what things are in the neighborhood that they can go out and do. And she likes to really network with a lot of people. OK, how do we evaluate a treatment, uh, whether it's a drug, a school, you know, whatever it is? Risk versus benefit. That's especially important in drugs. What I want you to do is I want you to think really logically. Now, right here, we're next to a major medical center. And I have to say, I love the hat they gave me. Psychiatry. It's more difficult than rocket science. <laughs> That's what the hat says. That's a wonderful hat. And you're near a major center here. So they're not going to be doing some of the stupid things that I see in other places. Like every time there's some kind of crisis, there's throwing another prescription at a kid. Nothing is thought about. You've got a 10-year-old that's on eight different things. No thought has gone into it. Every time there's trouble, it's either another drug or up the dose. And, and there's total lack of thinking has even gone into it. And then the kid's a zombie. 
fat and got diabetes or some other problems. Cost versus benefit. Yeah, you know, yoga, brain yoga. Yeah, you're going to have to show me that that works better than regular yoga. Um, evidence of effectiveness. Okay, something like colored paper, just go try it. Had somebody today where it worked. Yeah, that's going to change her, her life a whole lot. Light blue paper. Get it down at the print shop by the ream. I had a student that had tan paper. When she left, we had a whole filing cabinet full of tan paper, like forever. Well, it kept her from flunking out of college. But if something's expensive, dangerous, or, or really time consuming, then I'm going to have to have a, oh, you've got to give me the right scientific studies. You really got to give me evidence of effectiveness. Now, I've been experimenting with probiotics to control my urinary infections. And so I've got an N of one. It works. I buy the stuff at Whole Foods. My doctor couldn't get me off the antibiotics. He was suggesting I take Cipro prophylactically. I'm going to croak if I do that. <laughs> and so I, um, I just started playing around with stuff they had at Whole Foods. Yeah, one thing at a time. It's one thing I take. It's not a whole pharmacy full of junk. Risk versus benefit. Basically, with little kids, you want to be really conservative with medications. The younger they are, the more conservative. But there's a lot of older kids and adults, ones like me, that need a little help from biochemistry. One little antidepressant has worked for me. Try one thing at a time. A medication just has a wow factor. Like, oh, wow, this really works. Um, and if you're on a cocktail of junk, you're going to have to slowly try to get them off it. Be careful switching brands of generic for any medicine you use. They're not bioequivalent. And don't expect a drug to control 100% of behavior because it won't. These are some very nice books that are available, a Parent's Guide to the Medical World of Autism that's written by an old uh, experienced pediatrician. Hope for the Violently Aggressive Child. They use a lot of blood pressure medicines for kind of hot and sweaty kind of rage. I've seen this stuff work. OK, special diets help some people, others they don't. Some people have magnesium. Sometimes they get kind of can't sleep, might take a magnesium. Sometimes that helps be, you know, by taking some B vitamins. Uh, vigorous exercise, super important. I do 100 sit-ups every night, and I hate every single one of them, but they help me sleep. Weighted blankets help some people sleep. The omega-3 supplements are starting to get some science that they're good for the brain. OK, here are the Prozac-type medications. Um, let me tell you, the old stuff works. You know, there's, there's not really anything new that's on the market yet. There's a lot of patent extenders. Lots of things they tweak the formula. It's just a patent extender, an expensive ripoff. Uh, but for anxiety, really low doses. And then there's way too much of these given out like candy. And the only thing that they are approved for by the FDA is for irritability associated with autism. Well, what is irritability? I think it's sensory sensitivity. I know a lady that's taking a fourth of a milligram of Respiridol. This is a tiny microscopic dose, and she can now tolerate convention center. You know, so a little bit, but the problem is they give them out like candy. You don't give out powerful drugs like these to make them a teensy bit less hyper. That's not a good enough reason. You've, it's got to have really a serious wow factor. And be really careful with the doses. Well, I can tell you, the Veterans Administration knows how to do that on veterans. They use a lot of Prozac, and they start out really low, and they don't get the dose very high. Beta blockers, propanolol, that's talked about in that hope for the violently aggressive child. Uh, so I've got to remember, we're at a major medical center here, so maybe they've got some better things. But I do most of my talks out in the hinterlands. And it's a wasteland out there, as soon as you get away from the major medical centers. Some people are helped by the epilepsy drugs, especially when it's rage out of the blue. So there, this comes out of the blue, like there's kind of no reason for it. And sometimes the anticonvulsants will work. I've got an update on medical uh, stuff in the Way I See It uh, book. ADHD, there's a lot of crossover between autism, mild autism, Asperger's, and ADHD. And stimulants work on a lot of the verbal kids, make the nonverbal kids worse. You know, sometimes those work. You gotta look up interactions. Everything interacts. Antidepressants act as blood thinners, so I had salmon and dark green salad last night. I got a nosebleed at talk last night at a cocktail reception. Um, 
not cool. And that was an interaction between antidepressants, salmon, and uh, the green leafy salad. With, those are all blood thinners. Uh, yeah, I've got to be careful. I don't want a cerebral hemorrhage. That I definitely don't want. But I'm not going to take any aspirin on top of that. Okay, let's just go into, into um, genetics. It's a complicated genetics. It's at least half just genetics. And you get a lot of engineering and intellectual giftedness in the family histories. My grandfather was the co-inventor of the automatic pilot for airplanes. That's the geek genes there. Anxiety and depression, both sides of the family. Visual thinkers and artists on the mother's side. Food allergies and Asperger's, mild autism on the dad's side. Yeah, a real typical kind of, of family history.